so far away <laughs> it feels like I'm like reaching out to you mm. is it possible to get closer you can bring the chairs ah, good now I can see you. <laughs> I can see the smiles. I like I like that. <laughs> Good. Thank you. <laughs> So tonight we have a different formula. We have a translator. So uh, many merits. That's good. Then I can listen and try to understand Hindi. That's good. Ah, very good. Oh, and we have a special guest at the back. Hi. Good, good, good. In the Sangha, it's, um, it's quite special because um, a lot of the transactions that monks do uh, are very close because there is a rule in the Vinaya that um, we must be within Hatha Passa, which means uh, the length of a, an arm, basically, from each other when we do community transactions. So it's an aspect that I really uh, find quite, uh, quite interesting. Uh, very, it's very intimate when you have uh, 30 plus monks together uh, gathering for Uposata. Uh, we all are very close actually to each other. And so even uh, uh, receiving Upasampada uh, which means becoming an, a real bhikkhu is a whole procedure we need at, uh, usually 10 other bhikkhus that are 10 years or more in the robes and so it's uh, usually in the good Vinaya schools uh, you will have a lot more monks actually because they want to make sure that the transaction is valid because it's been done for 2,600 years and for us, it's something that we don't want to ever see disappear <laughs> or as, as long as it can endure. And so when we ordain, we're almost, um, 
we're touching like uh, our preceptor's knees almost because it's very we want to make sure that the 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 transaction takes binding basically that it holds so in the sangha it's a very intimate it's a very uh, close brotherhood or sisterhood for the nuns also so it's really uh, and so i like to have also people uh, closer <laughs> So, day one. The day one is alive. <laughs> Everyone is still alive. Good. <laughs> and so, <smiling. I> <laughs> so, tonight I would like to begin with a poem uh, from Clarissa Pinkola Estes. Uh, this is not from the Buddha, <laughs> but it is very close to what we practice. It's called Refuse to Fall Down. This is from uh, Clarissa Pincola Estes, which you can't translate. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that sounds in Hindi, but... Uh, and so it's called Refuse to Fall Down. And to me, this uh, actually, just the title represents the first of the right effort, basically. Refuse to fall down. If you cannot refuse to fall down, refuse to stay down. If you cannot refuse to stay down, lift your heart towards heaven. And like a hungry beggar, ask that it be filled. And it will be filled. You may be pushed down. You may be kept from rising. But no one can keep you from lifting your heart towards heaven. Refuse to fall down. If you cannot refuse to fall down, refuse to stay down. If you cannot refuse to stay down, lift your heart towards heaven. So, for me this uh, poem has really two clear uh, uh, sections to it. And this is talking directly about right effort what I call wise practice. So the first part is about um, sometimes we will encounter things that, uh, that we like it or not will, will bring us down, will bring our mind, our mind down. And to refuse to uh, fall down or to stay down is actually to let go of these things. It's, it's not about uh, pushing away or rejecting, but it's about letting that go and in our practice this is how we would understand this and just as a test what would be the next step i spoke about main mainly two steps of right effort or wise practice yesterday can somebody tell me the, the next step what, what is the next fold yes uplifting the mind and so raising your heart towards heaven so i think um, and you know, the, the Buddha used the word Brahma Vihara. So that's um, actually really, really close <laughs> to exactly what this, this poem says. And like a hungry beggar, ask that it be filled, and it will be filled. And this is what we're doing today. Today was a bit of a mishmash. It's a little bit fuzzy sometimes. We're not sure if we're still with the meditation or if we're with a hindrance, <laughs> if we're getting distracted or if we're staying with the metta. And so this asking is what we're doing. I, I mentioned to a few people today to maybe cultivate remembering happy memories that, that they had in their lives. And by repeatedly doing this, uh, the mind will start to catch up. And so at the beginning, it's hard to see, it's hard to uh, witness, because it's not, it's a little bit uh, subtle, but it will come. You may be pushed down, you may be kept from rising, but no one can keep you from lifting your heart towards heaven. So this is a practice that you must do, I cannot do for you. And so... By continually doing this, uh, you will get there. And it is your right, it is your birthright to actually do this. You, and everybody can. There's no, 
uh, limits on whoever that is. Everybody here can. So that's all up to you. And by the way, the Buddha said that practicing the metta, the karuna, mudita, upeka, uh, actually leads to heaven. So <laughs> it's not even uh, different. <laughs> so that's the name of the talk tonight, lifting your heart towards heaven. And the sutta I will be reading from is uh, dividing the two different kinds of thoughts that we can have. Okay. <laughs> um, in Pali, this is Vedha Vitakka Sutta. This is number 19 in the Majjhima Nikaya. Mm -hmm. I want bigger letters. <laughs> I don't know how. Do you know how? Ah, here it is. Oh. <laughs> Good. Acha. Good. So I really like to begin w uh, retreats with this talk either on the first day or the second day because it really goes at the core of what the Buddha taught. And the core is the heart of the practice, right, right effort, ah, yes. Yes, so that's, that's the heart, oh. <laughs> That's the heart of the path, basically. Um, so there are, there have, be, there have been many different understandings of what the Buddha taught, and it's been a long time now. It's been over two thousand five hundred years that the Buddha has come to this this world and left us this amazing legacy. Of course. Yes, you go. And of course, during that time frame, things will be changed. Things will be interpreted in many, many different ways. And so, that's why it's very good to go back uh, to the original sayings of the Buddha. What did he actually say? Um, and this is why in this particular tradition we always refer back to the actual Buddha Vachana so that we can, we can understand really what the Buddha was saying. And so this right effort, this I call it wise practice, is also called bhavana for those of you who are familiar with that term and uh, for those of you who are not bhavana is simply mental development basically and that's just a really interesting thing so how do we cultivate the mind how do we develop the mind well that's the purpose of this wise practice right effort and so we have to develop the wisdom to understand that there are two different kinds of intentions and thoughts in our lives. One that, ones that are wholesome, beneficial, that are nurturing our growth, mental growth and mental health. And there are others that are unbeneficial, unwholesome for us and for everybody else around us. And so this is amazing. This is so important to understand. I mean, I've been spending my my life so many years trying so many different paths spiritual paths and uh, even the Buddha's teaching I was told that what I was practicing with the Buddha's teaching and then I started studying deeper and then I started 
coming upon these discourses where the Buddha is explaining how to develop loving kindness and uplift the mind into samadhi and all that. And I was like, this is not what I'm experiencing at all. <laughs> so reading the discourses of the Buddha, um, that's really when uh, I started to understand that there was something here that I didn't, I didn't actually understand. There was something missing <laughs> to my path and I couldn't figure it out. I was reading the, the Buddha and I couldn't understand what he talked about because I couldn't experience that for myself. That was impossible at that point. And then I met Bhante Bhima Ramsey <laughs> and this particular tradition. And after my first retreat or second retreat, I started reading the suttas and it all made sense. It was exactly what I was experiencing. And now there's no more uh, questions about it. I couldn't believe that someone could answer all of my questions like that. <laughs> and so really, this is really important to understand. And the hindrances, the distractions that we're experiencing, they are rooted in unwholesome states. So it's like being in a canyon and you're shouting. And then what you're shouting, now you're hearing, and then you're not hearing it. But then it echoes back to you. And this is what you're feeling on the retreat right now, is the shouting of the world, wanting so many things, engaging the mind in so many things. It's agitating the mind all the time. And even if you stop, it echoes back into your mind. But fortunately for all of us, it's the same thing with wholesome states. <laughs> so you're coming here, and this is the other end of the canyon. Now you can actually sing beautiful states of mind, and they will actually come back to you when you leave here and go back to your daily life. It's like if you were given the choice, would you rather be happy or angry? Who would, would like to be angry? Like, would, would that be fun? No? Good. Everybody here is wise, so that's good. <laughs> and who, who would like to be happy? Good. <laughs> right? That's, that's a lot of wisdom right there. <laughs> good. Happy. Happy. <laughs> good. And so, it's really that simple. The states that we cultivate is what we will actually experience over and over again. So when we cultivate wholesome states, that's what we experience. When we cultivate loving kindness, compassion, joy, whether it's altruistic joy or just joy that is beaming, or equanimity, mental calm, these things all come with happiness, they come with peace, they come with serenity. And these wholesome states, naturally, they come with mental clarity, they come with mental steadiness, when we learn to cultivate them properly. And similarly, as a contrast, these unwholesome states, like agitation, anger, jealousy, hatred, animosity, impatience, all of these states, they are not mindful. They are reactionary. Something happens, there's contact, there's a feeling, there's a reaction, and it's not conscious. It's actually a blind reaction to something that is happening. And nobody on this earth that is angry is happy <laughs> and nobody that is angry is mindful nobody that is angry is experiencing mental calm it, these states are completely opposites and so this is what this sutta this discourse is about um, and there was a comment today that uh, people might not be familiar with what, what 
suttas are and what these original texts are. So maybe I'll, I'll give just a, a brief uh, explanation that so basically in uh, a particular tradition which I like to call early Buddhism it's often called Theravada Buddhism uh, I like to say that it's simply just from the early times uh, these texts um, so basically the words of the Buddha have been preserved uh, in their original language or what seems to be the closest to its original language that is Pali and it is found in a body of text that is called the Tripitaka so in, in that body of text we have the Vinaya Pitaka, the Sutta Pitaka and the Abhidhamma Pitaka which technically came a little bit later but uh, the first, the Vinaya Pitaka is mainly for the monks that is all the monastic rules and the way of life that monks will follow and the second is the actual Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha, that is called also the suttas. Uh, so basically all the discourses that the Buddha gave, not all of them, but uh, those that were uh, remembered by the Venerable Ananda, who uh, basically was asked to deliver all the discourses that he had heard from the Buddha uh, at the first gathering after the Buddha's death of the Parinibbana of the Buddha. So the Venerable Ananda Bhante was known to have a perfect memory. So for those of you who know what that means is that he would just uh, hear something and he would remember. <laughs> and fortunately for us he was the Buddha's uh, first attendant so he was always with the Buddha. So just for the record, I do not have a perfect memory, <laughs> quite far from that. <laughs> um, but I love the discourses of the Buddha, so <laughs> that's the only thing. And so I think, I think that's enough. I think that that's enough knowledge about what this is. And so actually there is a really good book by uh, Bhikkhu Sujato. Uh, it's called the... Um, authenticity of the early Buddhist texts if you want to know more about this it's a really good book and it proves in very many different ways that this teaching is genuine and there is really ancient proof that we can rely upon to say that these were actually the original teachings of the Buddha which is amazing after all these years that we still have that what did you say? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, do you understand Hindi? Oh, that's, okay. that's great. That's great. I'm going to have to spend more time here. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. I get the English parts, but... <laughs> um, hmm. So yeah, for, for me, uh, just remembering, just bringing up to my mind that we only that we have available to us this amazing uh, bank of knowledge that is from the Buddha is, of course, there are still like there are probably a few things that are not exactly the same, but still, there, it's amazing that we still have that uh, in our day and age. So. For me, it brings a lot of, so much gratitude, I, just thinking of that. So this is in Jeta's Grove at Anatta Pindika's Park Monastery, Arama. And there, the Bhagavan, the Buddha, the Awakened One, addresses the monks. And he says, monks, and they reply, Badhante. Then the Buddha says, before my complete awakening, monks, while I was only a bodhisattva, not yet a fully awakened one, I reflected. Let me meditate, discerning and dividing my thoughts into two categories.
From then on, monks, I gathered on one side thoughts of sensory desires, thoughts of anger, and thoughts of harm. Yes, okay. Oh, okay, okay, good. And I gathered on the other side thoughts of letting go, thoughts of non-anger, and thoughts of harmlessness. So it's already interesting how the Buddha does like, his approach. He's quite, uh, I mean, I would not have figured it out on my own, that's for sure. <laughs> then while I was meditating, attentive, intent, and resolute, there arose thoughts of sensory desires in my mind. Then I reflected, this is troublesome. And here we have the Four Noble Truths. This is mainly the first part of the Four Noble Truths. This is troublesome to others. And this is troublesome to both, to me and others. It's not really beneficial. These thoughts impede conscious discernment. They come with tension in the mind and they lead away from peace. And this is why I like to start with this one because it really makes clear, you know, see there's a, he did see that these states as, you know, this sensory engagement all the time is quite tiring actually. It's uh, very, it drains us. It takes a lot of our vitality, of our mental energy. And just to let that go for some time, you notice it when you close your eyes. Just close your eyes and you can feel the relief right there. Just from not having the visual input. And so this sensory desire, it's, it's also called sensual desires, it's also called lust sometimes, but this is, it, it can be a strong term for what this can actually be also, where it's also only when we just continually engage in the senses. So yes, of course it's all rooted in, in tanha, in this kind of desire. But these are strong terms and we can also see that as just, as I mentioned, just the sensory input of the eyes, just, just seeing that. Because this is kama, this is also basically engaging in the senses. And so engaging in the senses is very coarse for the mind all the time. So this is another way that we can see that. And this is why the first wise intention is nikkama, to relinquish, to let go, to renounce. This, again, this is a strong term for some people. We don't need to use that. Just letting go is, is quite accurate, actually. And it's interesting to know that the first wrong intention is, to, is this kama chanda, or this, this wanting this karma, this sensory input. And the wise intention is nikkama. So this happens also on many levels. It happens in the meditation. For example, you're sitting and you want uh, pancakes or something. <laughs> and you really love pancakes. And for you, that's like the all in all the best thing in the world. And now you're on retreat and they're not going to serve you pancakes. And you're just like, oh, I wish I could eat pancakes right now. It can be anything, really. That's just an example. And notice in, when you're meditating, whether it's pancakes or whether your thing is, um, I don't know, uh, uh, ice cream or roti or... Uh, what is your thing? Gulam cha. Okay, good. That sounds like something I can't say. <laughs> sounds great, though. <laughs> so, uh, I like roti, so for me, uh, <laughs> it's not like it invades my mind. But, um, and notice, when, when a thought like this arises, then the mind starts to incline, and it starts to actually narrow down, and then it starts to clench, and then it starts to create tension. And this can happen on any kind of level. It doesn't have to be really strong for you to notice, but at some point, 
somebody will notice. It will be like tension. So it's getting coarser and coarser and then it's tensed enough that you notice. And then you're like, yeah, okay. Maybe I'll calm down. Maybe I'll 6R. <laughs> so that's good. And that's the beginning of discernment. That's the beginning of cultivating awareness. So that's a, a, a cheat because that was my next question. <laughs> I was going to... I was going to ask, what are the six R's? But uh, there you go. <laughs> Good. And so, and so here we see basically the, the way that the Buddha started to understand the Four Noble Truths, the four understandings of the awakened people, the Ariyas. This is how I call the Four Noble Truths. And he says, as soon as I realized this is troublesome, or the, this comes with tension. This is troublesome is how I translate dukkha, by the way, a lot, of, a lot of the time. They faded away. So as soon as he understood that this was creating tension, that this was dukkha, then it's really easy to let it go. When you see, and what we call tension, actually there's just a sneaky way to say it's, that, that's dukkha. How do you know it's dukkha? Well, it, because it manifests as tension. That's how we know. As soon as I realized this is troublesome, this comes with tension, they faded away. As soon as I realized this is troublesome to others, they faded away. And as soon as I realized this is troublesome to both, they faded away. And so, also, you'll see that pattern a lot. Uh, sometimes we won't actually stop our bad habits until we notice that it's actually impacting or hurting others. So a lot of people uh, quit smoking, for example, because they have a partner and they don't like it. And it's uh, hurting them. That's just an example. But you see the, the, the way they wouldn't stop for themselves, but when they see that, it's actually impacting others, then they don't like it. And then that's a motivation. And that's the Four Noble Truths, is seeing that, oh, my, my actions are actually hurting others. And it's actually wanting to develop the wisdom to not do that, to move away from hurt. As soon as I realized these thoughts impede conscious discernment, they come with tension in the mind and they lead away from peace. They faded away. Okay. So this is really the way to work with the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are like this big, you know, it can be really complicated, but if you look at it simply, it's really just to realize that something is unbeneficial. It comes with tension and it's not fun. It's not pleasant. Then you just make calm, let it go. And this is the purpose did I cut you? Okay. This is the purpose of the Four Noble Truths. You know, th there is a direct application of these things. So the first half is only useful to the extent that you will apply the second half, which is to let go of what is causing the, the dukkha. And if, you just, if, if we just cultivate to know uh, this is dukkha, this is dukkha, so much dukkha, everything is dukkha, 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 and you don't let go, then all you're aware of is dukkha. There's no sukkha. There's no, there's no happiness. So that's really important. And this is where wise practice or right effort comes in. So I kept letting go thoughts of sensory desires as they arose. I kept on releasing them and bringing them to an end. They will keep echoing back, they will keep coming back because they have some momentum, they have a strength. We've been feeding these things for a long time. But here is, here is the alchemy, the alchemy center. We turn this thing into gold. And we take all the trash, <laughs> all the things that echo back that were not really pleasant, and we learn to transmute it and turn it into something really amazing. And so here he goes into the next two uh, wrong intentions or wrong kinds of thoughts. 
and it goes through pretty much the same sequence and I'm not gonna, it, it, it's pretty chunky uh, when you read the suttas really line by line because there's so much repetition. These texts were transmitted orally in the past and it helps to have a lot of repetition when you commit them to memory but when you actually read it as per, uh, uh, like in nowadays you would read a book uh, it's really, it's really not that literary. It's really not a pleasant, uh, always a pleasant style to be reading from. <laughs> so some repetition is uh, is definitely uh, useful, and it was probably meant also. But mm -hmm. s some of it is obviously uh, uh, later <laughs> kind of editing. <laughs> Okay, then while I was meditating, attentive, intent, and resolute, there arose thoughts of anger in my mind. So, see, here is the same thing, basically. And then he goes into uh, uh, thoughts of harming, violence, basically. Or I like to see that as restlessness, because that's kind of like the hindrance that we're not talking about here, that's also really common in a lot of people. Like that means anxiety, uh, being um, agitated, you know, the mind just going, but uh, it, it's not necessarily that it, you're wishing to harm anything, but it's, it's kind of violent in its, in its own way. So anger is also dislike. Dislike is, I don't like this. I, I really can't stand like this or that. And then... Uh, really not be okay with it and it's not necessarily full-fledged anger but it's also mild aversion fits in that category <laughs> or um, impatience impatience so he's applying the same format for these these uh, two other hindrances so as soon as he reflected this is troublesome this is troublesome to others and to both then it uh, these thoughts impede conscious discernment, they come with tension in the mind. That is the nature of unwholesome, unbeneficial, heavy states of mind. And they lead away from peace, then he was actually able to let that go. I lose my train of thoughts <laughs> every time, <laughs> so it's kind of, uh, it's a challenge for me, but it's good good keeping keeping me in check and so what is letting go how do we let go how do we actually let go well somebody said it <laughs> so when we recognize this is the step did you did you recognize this was the recognized step that he's saying this is tension right this is the recognizing step which is called wisdom also discernment and then release yes and then something happens in the body i think relax yes and then maybe uh Ah, yes, yes, re-smiling. Good, good. Why? Why smiling? Uplifting the mind, yeah, yeah. Good. And then, and then what happens? You just sit there. Good. Well, you, you can do that, actually. <laughs> but then I think uh, there's a, uh, something else after. Yeah, return. Re return to what? To thinking? No. To, to metta? Yes, yes. Okay. Good, good. And what does smiling have to do with it? Huh? Oh. Uplifts the mind. And, and that uplifts the metta also. Good. Yes, nourishes so that we make sure that we're not coming back with a mind that's got craving in it, that's got any kind of agitation or inclination for this or that. It's actually happy here and now. 
So it doesn't want anything else. It doesn't, it doesn't have to do anything with anything else. It's just here it's happy. What else would it want? So tying in to the notion of karma, the, the understanding that the, the Buddha broke through on his awakening, that we are actually in charge of this. We are empowered with our own lives and minds. And he goes into saying, whatever one frequently thinks about and reflects upon over and over again, this becomes the inclination of his mind. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of sensory desires, that person has left the thoughts of letting go to cultivate thoughts of sensory desires. Their, minds, their mind is bent upon sensory desires. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of anger or impatience or aversion, that person has left thoughts of non-anger, and non-anger is also metta, karuna, compassion, loving kindness, to cultivate thoughts of anger. See, we, we actually cultivate these things. So it's all conditioned, but we have a choice. We have a choice in which, which way we're going to condition. Their mind is bent upon anger. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of harm or restlessness, agitation, worry, anxiety, that person has left thoughts of calm or unagitation, peace, to cultivate thoughts of harm, thoughts of restlessness, thoughts of agitation, worry, and these things, they just build up. And now he gives this beautiful analogy of the cowherd. Just as in the last month of the monsoon season, in the late fall, when the crops are abundant, a cowherd would have to protect his cows. To do so, he would have to poke and push, pull and block his cows in line this way and that way with a stick and see that's what unwholesome states do when the mind is continually angry and we have to hold it in check otherwise we're just going to hit someone or something bad is going to happen and we have to make it force it control it push it down and so this is what the buddha is explaining in this beautiful simile and why would you do that because that cowherd sees that as the leader of these cows, he, would, he could be punished, imprisoned, fined, or blamed. In the same way, monks, I saw danger, degradation, defilement, and in unwholesome states of mind. And in wholesome mental states, I saw freedom, benefit, and natural clarity. So see, this is moving closer and closer to the understanding of what this bhavana is. We cultivating wholesome states, abandoning unwholesome states, and why do we do this? The wholesome mind is naturally going towards samadhi. It's not actually something that we do or we force, but through wisdom, we can abandon these hindrances that cause tension, and cultivate these uplifted states that come with beautiful clarity and calm and steadiness. So now he's moving towards wholesome states. Then, I, then while I was meditating, attentive, intent, and resolute, there arose thoughts of letting go, nikkama, in my mind. Then I reflected, this is not troublesome. This is not troublesome to others, and this is not troublesome to either. These thoughts are for the growth of conscious discernment. They bring no tension in the mind, and they lead to peace. And so, a lot of people think that metta is only uh, a practice that you do after a 10-day retreat for maybe 10 minutes, and then that's it. But actually, metta is a lot more than this. It's very powerful uh, conduit of awareness. It is a medium for awareness. It is 
a synonym, basically, of awareness. Because a mind that is caring is an attentionate mind, is a mind that is actually paying mm -hmm. attention, is caring. And that is completely, intimately related to awareness. And not only this, but metta, loving kindness, what I call boundless love, is like a beautiful, bright, white, clean slate or a cloth in the backdrop of the mind. And whenever a little speck will arrive and land on that canvas that is just beautiful and bright, you'll see it right away. <laughs> whenever a little tiny thought of anger arises, you'll see it right away. And so it's also a conduit, a medium for wisdom. It's not just a mere second-hand practice. It is very, very powerful for wisdom also, because we start to see that this loving kindness is so wholesome and happy and pleasant here and now. Whenever anger arises, we immediately recognize that this is not fun. <laughs> And then there's a little section here that wasn't possible in the previous one. He says, I reflected, if I were to think about and dwell in these thoughts at night, I see nothing to fear that could arise from this. If I were to think about and dwell in these thoughts during the day, I see nothing to fear that could arise from this. These states are completely wholesome, completely blameless. If I were to think about and dwell in these thoughts day and night, I see nothing to fear that could arise from this. But there will still be a lot of thinking. And even though it's wholesome thinking, then there's a thing to go beyond that. Because uh, we will see in the jhanas, the first jhana and the second jhana, the difference is that this discursive mind is, starts to fade away. And so this leads to his reflection next, which is, if I were to think and reflect constantly, even though it's completely wholesome, before long my body would become exhausted. With an exhausted body, the mind is unsettled. An unsettled mind is far from collected harmony, samadhi. I then calmed my mind and gathered it on itself. I unified it and brought it to peaceful harmony. Why? So that my mind be undistracted, even calmer. So this is why at the beginning we say, cultivate remembering happy memory, you know, we want to actually get this feeling going because that's the, that's the purpose of wholesome vitaka vichara. We apply the mind, we think wholesome thoughts that arise this beautiful joy, upliftment in the mind. And then it, it starts to, it, it extends a little bit. We can actually float a little bit on it, vichara. We can reflect upon it and imagine it, soak our minds into it. But then also the next step is that we will notice that if we were to constantly bring up all of your happiest memories of everything that you've ever done in your life, then your meditation wouldn't go deeper. <laughs> so, and this is also seen uh, slowly with the, the spiritual friend. So the spiritual friend, we use it to uplift the mind, we stay with it, and then we don't need to actually put so much effort into seeing or picturing that spiritual friend. We just know it's there. And we slowly learn to rest more and more the awareness on the feeling of metta itself, which feels more free, more light, more calm. And this touches upon another thing that we, we usually mention on a retreat is to not, not read because I know we have uh, so many books that are amazing here. But, <laughs> and even though it's really wholesome, 
it's constantly engaging the mind. And so for your own benefit, it's better to not read so much. If, if you can keep uh, Delson's amazing book for after the retreat, then it's, uh, it's gonna actually help you go deeper in your meditation because otherwise it just activates the mind again. Then while I was meditating, attentive, intent, and resolute, there arose a thought of non-anger in me, or loving kindness, or compassion, anything that's not connected to anger. Oh. And there arose thoughts of harmlessness, or basically if we tie it to the restlessness that I used before, that would be calm or peace or contentment. This, these are completely uh, uh, blameless, blameless states. But even if we were to, act, even if it's not dukkha, even if it's completely beneficial and wholesome, if we were to constantly engage our mind, still we would not get deeper. So whatever one frequently thinks about and reflects upon over and over again, this becomes the inclination of one's mind. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts, I changed the word here, of contentment or letting go, yes. <laughs> that was a little bit of improvising here. <laughs> so I have to remember what I used before. Um, if a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of letting go, that person has left the thoughts of sensory desires to cultivate thoughts of letting go. Their mind is bent upon letting go. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of non-anger, that person has left thoughts of anger to cultivate thoughts of non-anger, of metta. Their mind is bent upon non-anger, upon metta. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of harmlessness or calm, that person has left the thoughts of restlessness to cultivate thoughts of calm. Their mind is bent upon calm. So see here, this is so important and amazing to understand. These two different kinds of states, they are completely opposite to each other. They are different completely at the other end of the spectrum. Just as in, again, the simile of the cow herd, but now with wholesome states. Just as in the last month of the summer season, when all the crops have been harvested in the villages, a cow herd would keep an eye on his cows at the root of a tree in the open, only needing to be aware, there are the cows. <laughs> because these states are completely blameless, even though there would, the mind would be filled with them, it wouldn't matter. We couldn't really harm anybody, or not really consciously. It would be really mm, uh, fortuitous. In the same way, monks, I only needed to be aware, there are wholesome mental states. So this is the genius of the Buddha. And this is where I would like to uh, maybe try a little exercise with all of you. And this is actually from um, Ayasma Metananda, uh, which we did on last retreat, and it's uh, quite good. And I would invite you to bring your index in front of you, like this. And really focus all of your attention on the very, very tip of your finger without wavering. So the smallest point at the tip of your nail or finger and really Keep your attention there for a while.
and then you can let go of your finger and bring your awareness to the whole room. Do you feel the relief in your head? Just allow your awareness to be completely open. So this is what we are actually cultivating here. Every time the mind goes into a distraction, whether it is impatience or whether it's wanting something out there, it clenches, it grasps at it, whether it's even if it's pushing away, it, just that pushing away is a, a kind of grasping also. It's wanting this thing not to be. <laughs> so it's still wanting. <laughs> and so when we let go of that, when we apply the six R's, the mind actually naturally moves back and becomes much more spacious, much more open, calm, patient, and happy. And this is what I call natural samadhi. There is only one sutta in the whole uh, Sutta Pitaka that mentions this word, and it, the Buddha calls it Dhamma Samadhi, which is collectedness of mind that comes through Dhamma, which does not mean force. It means through wisdom, through understanding, through letting go. And for us, here is applying the six R's. So I will try to, yes, where is this mentioned? <laughs> I think it's the Pataliya Sutta in the Sanyutta Nikaya. It is the Sanyutta of the... Oh goodness. Yes, I, I can provide you the, the link. I actually translated this, so it's on the website also. You can look it up. Pataliya Sutta, and it's... Um, uh, I just have it on the tip of my tongue. But anyways, it's one of those Samyutas where the, um, the head, head man, the head... Uh, I forget the Pali. And he, he, he says you should uh, learn this Dhamma Samadhi, this Samadhi by way of Dhamma. And then what does he say afterwards? He says that classic gladness to collectedness sequence, which is recollecting the Buddha or the Dhamma or the Sangha or the virtues or generosity. The mind becomes glad, then their joy arises, then the body becomes calm, then with a calm body, one experiences happiness or sukha. With sukha, sukhino, chittang, samadhi, yati, then the mind gets collected because of that happiness. And this is what he said was that dhamma samadhi. Uh, it's, I have only found one mention directly. But this is mainly using the seven factors of awakening. It's just another way of combining them, basically. And so here, there's a slight variation, but it's very close to this natural samadhi. He says, unrelenting, uncurbed my effort was. So he's seen this with wisdom, these two states, and now he's completely devoted to abandoning all the unwholesome ones and to really bring in all the wholesome ones and to not even be attached to the wholesome ones, let his mind be completely open and liberated. Unconfused presence of mind came to be. My body became calm and free of tension. This is what happened. My mind became collected and harmonious. By applying the six R's, this is the result. And then he goes into all of the jhanas. We will see those uh, a little bit further. He only goes through the first four ones. I will read them, but I will not expound them tonight. This will be another night. And these jhanas, literally, jhana means meditation. That's pretty much all it means. It's been interpreted in many different ways, but 
really what this actually means is meditation. Letting go of all outward desires and letting go of unwholesome mental states, still attended by thinking and imagining with the blissful happiness born of letting go. I understood and abided in the first level of meditation. So see, this is what we just talked about. Uplifting the mind with wholesome states. With the calming of thinking and reflection, with inner tranquilization, my mind became unified. And this is the first mention of samadhi, actually, in the jhanas. Without thinking nor reflection, with the blissful happiness born of samadhi, of this beautiful collectedness of mind. This is the state where we will start to notice a unification. I understood and abided in the second level of meditation. With the calming of excited joy, it doesn't mean that it completely disappears, it just means that it becomes more mature, it becomes more steady, more calm, but it's still there. With the calming of excited joy, I abided in the mental steadiness, upekka. Present and fully aware, experiencing happiness within, one's bo with, within my body. A state which the awakened ones describe as such steady presence of mind, this is a pleasant abiding. Now this is something that some of you know already and some of you will get to know is that when the mind becomes very steady and clear and bright, it's very blissful. And this is not excited, but it is much better than the excitement. Then I understood and abided in the third level of meditation. This was the third, and now the fourth. Unattached to pleasant experiences and unstirred by unpleasant ones, as mental excitement and heaviness settles, one, my mind became balanced, purified by unmoving presence. I understood and abided in the fourth level of meditation. So this is like the, the culmination of Upeka, this beautiful steadiness of mind, which becomes very clear. And this strong difference between very strong feelings of Sukha or Dukkha are not as contrasted anymore. It's mental steadiness is so strong that these states of uh, agitation of dukkha or sukha or uh, a lot of uh, joy, for example, won't be as defined. It will be much more steady, much more calm, and that is where the mind starts to delight more and more. And now he goes into the tevijas, the threefold knowledges, and that's a little too much for us tonight. <laughs> and I will gladly skip over that and there will probably be another occasion later on this retreat and I will go to the third one which is really what we can use here and now for ourselves it is one of the it is the third knowledge uh, that he broke to uh, on the night of his awakening but it is also something that we can directly practice for ourselves here and now so doing this over and over again, he says, with a composed and collected mind, wholly cleansed and purified, clear and open, rid of imperfections, having become pliant and malleable, straight and unwavering, I directed and inclined my mind to the complete calming of the mental movements or the mental effluence, the asavas, basically. And for us, this is just the distractions. That's all we need to know. These, these movements of the mind that flow outwards and from the root shru to flow, asavas. Whether it's, some people say it's, they're coming in, some people say they're going out because the asava is, can be interpreted in both ways. Personally, I like to think that it's kind of like going into things and streaming out. But uh, these are simply distractions. 
So he has this beautiful, bright, clear mind that really is unimpeded, and this is quite something. Uh, a mind like this, uh, when it is inclined towards something, it can know a lot of things. And he decided to incline that to the understanding of what, what is this habit of the mind into flowing into everything. Bhante Vimalaramsi he would say that this is to notice mind's attention, how mind's attention moves from one thing to the other. And that's, that's also a good uh, way of talking about asalas. So he's taking this beautiful mind, clear mind, unimpeded mind and directs it to the complete calming of all little residual bits of distractions, of mental movements at this point. I understood mental movements, movements as they really are. This is tension. This is the increase of tension or the source of tension. This is the release from tension and this is how to release the tension. How to release the tension? Six. There's six steps in it. Uh, six hours. <laughs> Good. Just checking if you're still awake. <laughs> Good. Good. A very easy question. <laughs> Good. I understood mental movements as they really are. These are the distractions. This is the increase of distractions. This is the release from distractions. And this is how to release distractions. To so see how they come hand in hand, the, the Four Noble Truths apply directly. And this is what you're doing on this retreat. You've already started doing this without even knowing, or with knowing. But, so this is, this is uh, the third uh, understanding that he broke through on the night of his awakening, but it's also here and now. Sanditiko akaliko. So, immediately effective. Okay. <laughs> Continually observing and understanding in this way, with the template of the Four Noble Truths, the Four Understandings of the Aryas, my mind was released from the inclination for clinging outwardly to all of these things, from the inclination to projecting in the future, oh, after this retreat, I'll do this, and then the next week I'll do that, and then the month after, I'll become a doctor, and then I'll go fly to the moon, and then, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and from the inclination to negligence, in that release, I knew this is release. So once he experienced it, he just knew, like, this is it. It's hard for us to understand because we don't have that direct experience. But this is how all the Arahants also say. It's when they experienced it, they knew, yeah, this is the release, basically. There's nothing else after this. There's no more conceit. I directly knew unwholesome states have been overcome. Lived is the spiritual life. Done is what should be done. There is no more conceit here. This is the third understanding, which I realized in the last watch of the night. Blindness was driven out and clear understanding arose. Darkness was driven out and light arose, just as it happens in one who meditates attentive, intent, and resolute. So continuously we do this. And now at the end, he just gives, he hands on this beautiful simile of the path. Just as if there was in a remote forest a vast and extensive marsh on low-lying grounds where would live and forage a great deer colony, so lots of deers. Then some men would come intent on their room, intent on their harm, intent on capturing them, hunting them. He would cover up the safe and free path to be traveled with joy. And he would open a deceptive path, set down a groomed male decoy, and bring up a domestic female lure. 
Because of this, after some time, the great deer colony would be brought to ruin and decline. Then some men would appear intent on their happiness, intent on their welfare, intent on their liberation. He would clear up and reveal the safe and free path to be traveled with joy. And he would cover up the deceptive path, release the, the male decoy, and remove the female lure. Because of this, after some time, the great deer colony would be brought to growth, prosperity, and abundance. This story I just told you, monks, is to teach a lesson. Here is the meaning. The vast and extensive marsh on low-laying grounds. This is a designation for sensory desires. The great deer colony, this is a designation for all living beings. The men intent on their ruin, harm, and capture, this is a designation for Mara and wickedness. The deceptive path is a designation for the unwise eight-spoke path which is unwise understanding, unwise thoughts, unwise speech, unwise behavior, unwise living, unwise practice, unwise awareness, and unwise meditation. The male decoy, this is a designation for the happiness of craving. So there is a certain amount of happiness that we find in craving, but unfortunately it's rotting us at the root <laughs> when that's all we know basically the other dear lure this is a designation for lack of conscious discernment the men intent on their happiness welfare and liberation this is a designation for the truth finder the tathagata truly worthy and perfectly all awakened the safe and free path to be traveled with joy. This is a designation for the eight-spoke path of the awakened ones. Wise understanding, wise thoughts, wise speech, wise actions, wise living, wise practice, wise awareness, and wise meditation. Monks, I have reopened the safe and free path to be traveled with joy. And I have revealed and closed the deceptive path, released the male decoy, and removed the female lure. Monks, what should be done by a teacher for his students, holding their best interest at heart, out of loving compassion, that I have done for you. There are these roots of trees, monks. There are these empty huts these empty dorm cells. Meditate, monks, do not be neglectful. Lest you become remorseful when the time has passed, this is my advice to you. This is what the awakened one said, and with an uplifted mind, the monks delighted in the awakened one's words. Sadhu, sadhu. So I know it's getting late. Um, I'm getting used to this new formula. So this is wonderful, uh, by the way. I think it's great that people get to hear this in Hindi as much as they can. Sad, sad. And so just um, there was a comment made uh, to me last retreat that I should give a summary after. <laughs> so maybe I'll wrap it up very quickly. So there are these two kinds of thoughts, wholesome and unwholesome. The wholesome one brings us mental clarity, steadiness, samadhi, happiness. The unwholesome ones, the complete opposite. They bring much dukkha, much distress, worry, agitation. They're not good for anybody, not good for ourselves. And these are exactly what these distractions are. And these distractions that keep coming up, they are just the echo in the mind. We've shouted something and now we come to retreat and now we get to hear the echo. But the echo only lasts for so long. And then what we've shouted in, the, in our day-to-day -day life, 
now we, we get to hear the echo because we, we stopped doing all these things so we get more we ha actually have more awareness so it's it seems big but then it will calm it will calm down and like some somebody said today let the mud settle and uh, the dust settle down and that only takes time and we only practice we only do the practice use the six R's pra practice the metta or whatever your object of meditation is for those who have practiced before and it's simply bound to happen there's no need to force anything so just by continually doing this the mind will settle so in my own community and uh, retreats, usually I offer to share the merits in Pali first and then uh, to say it together in English. Would that be of any interest uh, to you? Or we can just do the English. Okay, okay. So I will say this uh, very famous uh, sharing of merits uh, sentence uh, that Bhante Vimala Ramsey uh, is quite well known for. I will say that, se that sequence in Pali and then we'll say it all together uh, in English. Oh, yes. 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 Good. <laughs> so I don't forget. Dukkha patta chani dukkha bhaya patta chani bhaya soka patta chani soka hontu sabbe bhipani no Irang no punyang sabbe sabta anu modantu sabba sampatti siddhya aga sabta cha bhumanta deva naga mahitika punyang tang anu maritva chirang rakantu buddha sasasana. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Thank you. Yes, I forgot again. I just love it. What is question in Hindi? Prashna. In Singhala is Prashnayak. Is it the same? Uh, uh, I was wondering what was a uh, no problem. In Singhala is Prashnayak Ne. What is it in Hindi? Prashnayak There is no problem. Oh. <laughs> hmm. Actually the word um, is the same word for question and problem, so it's a bit confusing sometimes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So the six R's should only be applied when the mind is completely out if from the, uh, the object of meditation. When it's actually uh, completely distracted. 
when it has left the vehicle of awareness. If we try to apply the six R's all the time, it actually becomes a hindrance <laughs> because you're thinking. <laughs> So we want to, whatever your object of meditation is, let's say it's metta. And if you're floating on the metta and there's no hindrance, there's no distraction, there's no need for the six R's at that point. The six R's are only useful when the mind gets hijacked, when the mind leaves completely that, oh, that resting place of loving kindness. And then we apply the six R's, we let go of craving, let go of distractions, uplift the mind back into the object of meditation. And then we stay with that as long as we can. And that doesn't mean to force it, but that just means not necessarily like spinning the six R's wheels all the time. <laughs> we will learn to do, use the six R's and roll the six R's, yes, but whenever it is needed only. Any more questions? How, how do you differentiate spiritual life all the time? Do you know what I mean? Spiritual bypassing? Like, sometimes it's like part of being human is to feel angry. And yes. Yes. Yes, that I understand what you, you mean. And um, I would say that actually this is part of this practice to not repress or suppress these things. That would be the first step actually. Because uh, some anger, you know, if, if you would hold it in check, then it wouldn't arise and it wouldn't be locked inside. And that's something we don't want to do. That's called covering up, basically. What we want to do is be free and be open. And if sometimes there will be anger, then it can arise, yes, fine. And then we can just try to see, okay, uh, are you happy in the moment? Is that, is that pleasant? And then there's a whole side of forgiveness that we can actually also learn to develop, which is very useful for these moments that are coarser, bigger chunks, bigger blocks that come up. And that does happen even for advanced meditators. Uh, because the mind is so open, it's so uncovered, it, it cannot hide. That, that this is what we're learning to do here. It's like completely be, becoming open. And so whatever is in there that we've locked in, in the basement, I call it the monsters in the basement. So whatever monsters we've put in the basement and locked lock the door, then actually we're going to have to open the door here and look at them, invite them in. And some people say serve them tea, invite them in and then say like, okay, monster. So what do we do now? Because you can't, you can't just keep those in the basement forever. Uh, they have to come up. If you want to really be genuine, happy, and open in your life, and light, then these things you, you cannot carry around. So sometimes it will manifest an, as an outburst of emotional reactivity, or anger, or you know, anxiety, or distress. And that's normal. Mm -hmm. The first step is to allow allow that to come up because then otherwise you can't even recognize it so yeah mm -hmm. yes 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 mm. 
Yes. It's right. Yes. Microdosing relaxation. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. I know what you mean. Um, so, actually, what happens is the meta itself is calming. It is soothing. So, as I was reading before that sequence, when there's gladness, pamoja when there is PT that arises because of the gladness and then the body becomes calm actually and that metta and, and calm tranquility um, you're actually relaxing when you're practicing metta otherwise you wouldn't get deeper and it would be very hard to sustain because you need to relax into love that's what I write in my, in my book basically it's, like letting go, relaxing into that love. Because if you were to try too hard, then it would just impede the love anyways, the loving kindness. Um, like I said this, this today quite a few times, th this meditation, this metta is really, it's like the sun. The sun is not thinking about shining it's just shining <laughs> and so it's the nature of boundless love of metta whenever you feel it it actually shines whether you want it or not <laughs> and whatever we do that we want to like make it more or make it be a, another way actually that's actually enclosing it that's actually dimming it down and it's not allowing it to be completely radiant in its natural state. So to tie it back to your question, because that's probably you're thinking, this is not what I asked for. <laughs> then uh, the thing is that when it's so simple and open and just as it is, you have to let go. You ha it, this has to have relaxing in it because it cannot reach that stage if you're not relaxing so in a way the like bringing up the metta working with metta and making it continuous has to come with a lot of letting go stepping out of the picture and allowing the feeling to be because that's how the feeling reaches full bloom is when you stop trying to do it and it just actually becomes very integrated it becomes very effortless and it's very subtle and steady and very open and anything you would do on top of that would just make it more coarse or less uh, less uh, bright so it has to it has to come with letting go it has to come with relaxing otherwise and to uh, to further your point uh, the Buddha used uh, four uh, four little lines that he used a lot and these four characteristics is really like how we practice this path and he said Viveka nisittang, viraga nisittang, niroda nisittang, vosaga parinami. And that means basically to practice, that our practice be rooted in always in detachment, in letting go. In viraga, calming down, relaxing. That's the relaxed step that you're talking about. And uh, niroda nisittan, bringing, bringing things to an end or unobstructing the mind, basically, which culminates into liberation, into surrender. And so this is actually found a lot in the suttas. And this. Uh, it's a template for what you're saying, basically. 
it's not just in the Anapanasati. That's, I guess that's why I'm saying this, is that I want to take this Pasambhaya kara, uh, Kaya Sankara out, this relaxed step, out of the, just the Anapanasati Sutta. It's actually in other suttas, but it has different shape. <laughs> and we just have to understand it the proper way. And when he talks about Viveka, when he talks about Viraga, one of the problems is that the word Viraga is usually translated as dispassion, but it doesn't just mean dispassion, it can also mean calming down. Like in the third jhana, the joy calms down. It doesn't become dispassionate, it calms down. So when we understand that, we understand these basic principles that the Buddha taught, and the relaxed step is in so many more places than just the Anapanasati. So yes, there is a lot of uh, basis actually for, for what you're saying everywhere in the suttas. Whether we practice the Brahma Viharas or whether it's the Satipatthanas. Good. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, short question, long answer. <laughs> Acha, we good. <laughs> okay, have a good night. Take care of yourself. Enjoy. Be happy. Stay light. Good. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Very good. Apitayam chakumaikaraja. Savanno Pata Vipabhaso Tang Tang Namasami Harisavanna Pata Vipabhasam Dayanja Gudda Vihare Murati Himbra Mena So